when we think about the crucifixion of Jesus, we're inclined to think about the physical suffering that Jesus endured while he was on the cross. Although the writers of the four gospels were aware of this physical suffering, when they wrote about the crucifixion, they went in a different direction. They, they talked about other things that were to convey a different message than that Jesus physically suffered on the cross. And so we're gonna start the first of three classes, Bible studies on the crucifixion of Christ. And we're going to look at it from a different perspective, trying to look at it from the perspective that the author of the gospel of John had in mind when he talked about Jesus going to the cross and dying for our sins. The crucifixion of Jesus is our central part of our faith as Christians. It's central to our faith in God that we will not have to pay the penalty for our sin because Jesus took that penalty upon himself. We call this substitutionary atonement. And basically, God took out his wrath, judgment, and punishment on Jesus instead of taking it out on us. Jesus was the substitute sacrifice for our salvation because he paid the price for us. We, if we believe in him, then we can have our reconciliation with the Lord and we can stand before the Lord and be adopted into the Lord's family and receive eternal life. So tonight's class, we're gonna talk about the first of three classes on the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is going to be the part that emphasizes the fulfillment of prophecy. And we're gonna focus on how the crucifixion of Jesus fulfilled biblical prophecy. Now, I mentioned in the reference material, the sections of all four gospels that talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. And we're gonna talk about it in these three classes up to the point of Jesus' death on the cross. Now, in the past few weeks, we have been studying the events that led up to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. We know that Jesus was taken into custody, arrested during the early morning hours of Friday before the celebration of Passover later that evening. He is arrested by armed soldiers and officials sent by the high priest and the Pharisees who were led into the Garden of Gethsemane by Judas, who had been taken over by Satan and who received a bribe for betraying Jesus. We know that Jesus did not resist being arrested. He purposely allowed himself to be arrested in order to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies and God's will to complete God's plan of redemption and salvation. Jesus was taken before the Jewish leaders who after three hearings found that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy and sentenced Jesus to death even though there was no crime and no credible evidence that Jesus had committed any crime and that Jesus was telling the truth about being the son of God. Because the religious leaders did not want to be held responsible for putting Jesus to death on the eve of Passover, they decided to take Jesus to the Roman governor, Pilate, demanding that Pilate have Jesus executed under Roman law instead of stoning Jesus to death under Levitical law. After examining Jesus, Pilate told the religious leaders who brought Jesus to him that he found no basis for executing Jesus. However, the religious leaders continued to pressure Pilate to carry out their demands to crucify Jesus. When Pilate learned that Jesus was from Galilee, which was under the jurisdiction of Herod and Antipas, he sent Jesus to Herod. Herod refused to take Jesus seriously and asked Jesus to perform miracles and signs to satisfy his own curiosity. When Jesus remained silent and did not respond to Herod, Herod mocked and ridiculed Jesus by dressing Jesus in a royal robe, insulting Jesus and abusing Jesus before sending him back to Pilate. Pilate's attempt to avoid being held responsible for deciding Jesus's fate by sending Jesus to Herod failed and Jesus was brought back to Pilate a second time. Pilate found that Jesus had not committed any offense which merited Jesus being crucified. He unsuccessfully attempted to avoid responsibility for crucifying Jesus. But pressured by the Jews who were blackmailing him about going to Caesar, Pilate acquiesced to their demands 
and ha handed Jesus over to his Roman soldiers to be crucified. In tonight's lesson, the first of three lessons, we will focus on the crucifixion of Christ as a single historical event which fulfilled God's redemptive plan. The main message that I want you to get from tonight's lesson is that fulfilling Old Testament prophecies about God's plan of salvation for mankind, Jesus' suffering, sacrifice, and death on the cross was a single historical event accepted by God in atonement for the sins of mankind. So we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy about God's plan of redemption for mankind. First, we're going to have an overview, and then we're going to look at how the Romans used crucifixion as a means of executing criminals, insurrectionists, and enemies of Rome. And then we're going to talk about how the crucifixion of Jesus fulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament and prophecies by Jesus, which revealed God's plan of redemption for mankind. And then we have some really good discussion questions for Paul to ponder. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk about the overview of the crucifixion of Jesus. As I mentioned, all four Gospels discuss the crucifixion of Christ, and each Gospel provides information about the crucifixion and the death of Jesus on the cross. You, there's no single Gospel account that tells the entire story. And so what you have to do is you have to really piece it all together. But since we're studying the Gospel of John, we're going to emphasize his uh, version or account of the crucifixion of Christ and why he presented the things that he did. Now, the as I mentioned, the crucifixion and death of Jesus was a culmination historical event accepted by God in fulfillment of God's plan of redemption for mankind. From the very beginning, God's plan, knowing that man would sin and fall away from him, was to have Jesus sent into the world as a man and as God to take on the punishment and wrath that God has against sin. And by taking it on himself, then by recognizing and believing Jesus is the son of God who took on the sacrifice on the cross, that we can have redemption with God and eternal life with God. Now, the four Gospels, and especially the Gospel of John, reference the physical suffering of Christ, but each of them in their own way emphasize the spiritual suffering of Christ as he took upon himself the wrath, judgment, and punishment of God for the sins of those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, whose suffering and death on the cross fulfilled God's redemptive plan. Now, in order to fully understand how Jesus completed God's plan of redemption, it is necessary for me to divide the crucifixion of Christ into three separate studies. And so the first study that we're going to do tonight is we're going to focus on the scripture prophecies that were fulfilled. In the next week, in the second study, we'll focus on God's wrath, judgment, and punishment dispensed. And the third class will focus on God's redemptive plan finalized. So before we get started, and I want you to, if you can, keep the notes on this part of the outline, because I spent a lot of time putting together a sequence of events and a timeline for the crucifixion of Christ, basically extracting information from all four Gospels. And so the timeline is approximate, because you got to remember back in Israel's time, in Jesus's time, they didn't have watches. Basically, their time was governed by the sun and when the sun rose and when the sun reached the high point in the day and when the sun set. And so this is why Passover would start in the evening. And that was a, a, a it flowed with the different days or the time of year um, that the event took place. So we're going to start with where we left off. And that was Jesus had come before Pilate a second time and that was sometime around 6 six thirty, or 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to put it at 7 o'clock because we know that daylight or the early morning when the Sanhedrin held their last third trial and then went over and sent Jesus to Pilate that happened around 6 or so and then Pilate visited with Jesus and then sent him on to Herod and then Jesus was mocked and dressed in a robe and then returned to Pilate. So 
I'm going to say about an hour of time passed. It's not exact, but it's just a reference point. So about seven o'clock that Friday morning, Jesus appeared before Pilate a second time. Now, we know that Pilate spent some time with Jesus. Jesus was uh, beaten by the guards. He was presented before the crowd several times who demanded that Pilate crucify him. We know that Jesus had to be there around an hour worth of time. So about eight o'clock, Pilate handed Jesus over to his soldiers to be crucified. Now, before nine o'clock, and we know from the gospels that Jesus was crucified or put on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning. We know this because it's measured by the hours that are referenced in the gospels. So before nine o'clock, and that is after Jesus was released to the guards, handed over to the guards to be crucified, and Jesus was then led to the cross, and he was at the cross at Golgotha at, at nine o'clock in the morning, we know these events happen. The soldiers placed a robe around Jesus and a crown of thorns on Jesus' head and beat Jesus and mocked him. I mean, Jesus was already been flogged, but now they're put a Roman robe around him and they put a thorn, uh, a crown of thorns on him and they continue to mock him and beat him. Then we know that the soldiers removed the robe from Jesus and dressed Jesus in his own clothing. That's important because Jesus had been dressed in robes and royal robes and everything, but the soldiers at the cross divided Jesus's clothing. So we know that he had to be dressed again in his own clothing before he went to the cross. Then we're told by, uh, in various ways by John that Jesus went out or by the other gospel writers that Jesus was led, but the soldiers led Jesus and two criminals out of the city to Golgotha. And so what we know is that um, in the act of crucifying people, the Roman soldiers normally had to drag prisoners to the cross because they were terrified. Some of them would almost display insanity in being taken to the cross. But in the Gospels, we, we see that Jesus was led to the cross. And so we're going to look at the significance of that. There are two criminals that were with him. John mentions the criminals, but in the other Gospels, we're told that these were criminals that had committed fairly serious of offenses. Um, perhaps they were in the uh, rebellion that Bar Barbabas uh, was involved in. But the, the capital crime of uh, crucifixion was for more serious crimes. These were serious criminals. Jesus carried his own wooden cross to the uh, uh, Golgotha until Roman soldiers recruited Simon from the crowd to assist him. Now we don't know whether Jesus was dragging the full cross holding on to the, where the crossbeam was, or he was just carrying the crossbeam. But it, the sense is, is that when Simon assisted Jesus, that Jesus was dragging the whole cross because Simon picked up the plank from behind Jesus to assist him. So it, it almost infers that maybe Jesus was carrying the whole cross with it and that Simon carried the the pole part of the cross, the bottom part, lifting it up so that it wouldn't be dragged on the ground to assist Jesus to carry the cross uh, to the place of execution. We get to nine o'clock in the morning. Jesus and the two criminals arrive at Calvary, Golgotha. And then we are told that the soldiers removed Jesus' clothing and nailed Jesus on a wooden cross, which they positioned between the two criminals. All three, all of the gospels refer that Jesus was placed in the middle position between the two criminals that were being crucified with him. Jesus cried out, Father, forgive him. And you know the rest of the language, but basically that's when Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And so Jesus is on the cross. He asked for forgiveness. This is an important part because the two criminals that were being crucified with Jesus heard them. And all the gospels say that the two criminals 
were rebuking and criticizing and mocking Jesus, along with all the others that were there mocking Jesus, um, say, telling Jesus, well, if you saved others, why can't you save yourself? Things like that. And so anyway, they heard Jesus ask God to forgive those that were crucifying him. Then between nine o'clock and noon, a three hour period, the crowd mocked, insulted, and blasphemed Jesus. The Roman soldiers divided Jesus' outer garments among them and cast lots for his tunic. So after that, both criminals insulted Jesus, but then one of the uh, criminals believed Jesus and asked Jesus for forgiveness. That's when Jesus responded, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we have a change of heart of one of the criminals. And the second time that Jesus spoke from the cross before noon was when he said that day you'll be with me in paradise. Then Jesus looked at his mother and John and cried out, dear woman, here's your son. And to John, the apostle, behold your mother. This is when Jesus transferred responsibility for the care of his mother to the apostle John. Now we reach noon. Jesus has been on the cross for three hours, and those are the significant events during that three-hour period. What happens at noon? Total darkness. It's eerie. It's high noon. The sun is at its highest uh, peak in the sky, and now there's full darkness. Now we're talking about the afternoon or p.m. Between noon and three o'clock, what happened? This is when God poured out his wrath, judgment, and punishment on Jesus. And we're going to spend a lot of time next week talking about what happened during that three-hour period and what the Gospels reveal about the interaction between Jesus, God, and just the entire environment of Jesus bearing the punishment for our sins. At three o'clock in the afternoon, darkness is dispelled. It's light again. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he cries out, I'm thirsty. A Roman guard offered Jesus a hyssop dipped in vinegar wine, places it up to his mouth. Jesus apparently takes some of the uh, vinegar wine, and then he cries out, it is finished. And then he cries out, cries out, yell, this is a loud voice crying out that, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. Note that crucifixion usually attrits the ability of a person to do anything. And they die of suffocation because their lungs collapse as they're trying to breathe and they lose the strength to even raise themselves to breathe. But Jesus cries out loudly so everybody can hear. So as soon as Jesus cried out, Father, into my hands. Jesus dismisses his spirit, drops his head, and dies. The veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom. There's an earthquake which splits rocks. And then people around Jerusalem see departed saints that appeared to many of them. So that's pretty much the most detailed chronology of the events of Jesus' crucifixion. We're not going to talk about all parts of it tonight, but we're going to refer to it in the two classes that come as well. Let's talk about crucifixion. The Romans used crucifixion as a means of executing criminals, insurrectionists, and enemies of Rome. It was first used by the Persians to execute criminals and prisoners of war. The Sea People or the Phoenicians continued the practice, which they carried over when they settled Cartha. Uh, the Carthinians in North Africa. Now, they practice the uh, uh, execution by crucifixion. And when the Romans conquered Carthage, then they picked up the practice. But they perfected the practice. To the Romans, crucifixion was widely used with, throughout the empire. Uh, it was used to make an example of people so people would not rebel against Rome. A Roman citizen could not be crucified unless the Caesar himself approved or ordered the crucifixion. 
according to Cicero in his writings, he considered the uh, death by crucifixion as the most cruel and horrifying method ever devised by man. Crucifixion involves a slow and painful death, which involved bleeding from the floggings which preceded it before the prisoner was ever nailed to the cross. So flogging was part of getting the prisoner to be weakened to suffer even more on the cross. Then the next things that happen is the prisoner is suffering from exhaustion, fatigue, heat prostration, dehydration, and finally suffocation. It's a slow, painful death. Most of the times crucifixion was accomplished outside the cities and it was accomplished along the highways. So these people that were slowly dying, suffering, and being pecked at by the birds and mocked at by the people, as you pass by, you would see people crucified. And this was a common experience. People coming in and out of Jerusalem all the time saw people being crucified by the Romans. Um, the Jews never practiced crucifixion. Now, we know that, but it needs to be stated because this is very important in terms of the prophecy about Jesus being crucified. The Jews did not, in the Old Testament, they didn't even know anything about crucifixion. Rome didn't exist. Crucifixion didn't exist. And yet, in the prophets, prophetic messages that God gave to the Jewish prophets, he's talking about crucifixion, something that the Jews don't know, have any idea what they're talking about. The, now, what they used instead was the practice of stoning capital offense criminals or prisoners to death. That would involve throwing the prisoner into the pit and either if the prisoner died from the fall or if he didn't, then the one that accused him that threw him into the pit would take the first rock and throw it at the head or the heart to kill the prisoner. They stoned him to death. Jews executed people by lay, pushing them down into the earth. Romans executed people by lifting them up on the cross. Um, the expression, the Roman expression was that prisoners were handed over for crucifixion. And as I mentioned before, if you were a prisoner who was sentenced to die by crucifixion, you're aware of all the people you've seen die of crucifixion and now it's your turn and you're terrified and you're going to resist and so we'll talk about that the point that john makes in his gospel <clears throat> is that the crucifixion of jesus fulfilled prophecies in the old testament and from jesus himself which revealed god's plan of redemption for mankind despite the fact that crucifixion was never practiced by the Jews and was completely unknown to the prophets in the Old Testament, God had revealed that the coming Messiah would suffer and die on the cross of crucifixion. God didn't use the word crucifixion, but when we look at the verses in Psalms 22, it describes exactly what crucifixion is all about. During his earthly ministry, Jesus himself prophesies, prophesies that he would be lifted up as a sacrifice and atonement for mankind's sin. Jesus referred to being lifted up, and John specifically said that that was referring to the manner of Jesus' death. So we have Old Testament prophecy and Jesus' own words in advance prophesizing that his death would be by crucifixion. In writing his gospel, everything which John wrote about the crucifixion of Christ was written to demonstrate the fulfillment of prophecies about the Messiah to prove that Jesus was the son of God who promised God promised to send to suffer and take upon himself the wrath, judgment, and punishment of God in atonement for the sin of mankind. In chapter 21, we're going to see, in chapter 20, we're going to see that John writes the, that the purpose of his writing the gospel was for those to believe that Jesus is the son of God and by believing receive eternal life. And so John's focus on Jesus's crucifixion is part of his whole gospel, which is to prove that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the son of God. And by believing that you'll receive eternal life. 
Now, we often speak of the events which surrounded the crucifixion of Christ as fulfilling Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. However, in saying this, it's important to remind ourselves that God is not causing the people that are involved in crucifying Christ to do what they do. They're doing what they are trained to do. They're doing what they would naturally do. So what is prophecy? I've looked at all different definitions, but this is the definition that I think makes the most sense to me. Prophecy is future history foretold beforehand. As Pastor said in his sermon Sunday, God knows all things. He knows what's going to happen. And what he does, knowing all things, he knows the future. He knows that eventually Rome is going to be in control of the world. He knows that Rome is going to practice crucifixion. But what he does is he tells future history to the prophets before the event happened. So it's future history foretold beforehand. And knowing of this, God knowing all things, he can be very specific in telling the future history. And we're going to focus on the future history of the crucifixion. Now, when in the future the events actually take place, they happen in the specific manner which God had previously revealed. So we say it's fulfilling prophecy, but that indicates maybe cause. But what God did is he said, I know the future. This is what's going to happen. And then it, in future history, it happens just like God said. And so the cause is really not there. Um, as an example, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53 says that the Messiah as a suffering servant would be pierced for our transgressions. And he revealed to God revealed to King David in Psalm 22, the specific details of the Messiah's suffering by describing the effects of being crucified. So Jesus is revealing future history beforehand that later in time takes place as history. Now, on top of this, we have to add the fact that not only does God reveal future history, but God acts in the history of mankind. How did, when um, God heard the cries of the Israelite people and he acted by revealing himself to Moses and sending Moses into Egypt to lead the people out of Egypt from slavery. So we have a combination of God foretelling what's going to happen, but we also have God acting in history. God is part of human history. And a lot of people that so supposedly say that, you know, professors of history, they discount the fact that there's a major actor in human history they don't even pay attention to, and that is God himself. And so when we talk about God as an actor, well, God in, knows that his plan for redemption is to send the Messiah. He acts in history by sending the angel to Mary and then making uh, be, having Mary become pregnant with Jesus. And so he acts in history by sending an incarnate or bodily form of God to earth, his son. And so we have a combination of God knows the future, but he also acts in, uh, in history. So um, the combination of that is kind of what John is trying to put together in his gospel. Now, um, when John and the other authors of the gospel wrote their account about Jesus's crucifixion, the words they used and the events they described demonstrated the truth of what God had revealed beforehand in prophecy. Now we're going to narrow it down to focus on John's account of the crucifixion and inserting where appropriate some of the other writings of the gospel in order to illustrate the point that the account of the crucifixion of Christ demonstrates the fulfillment of prophecy. The God revealing to the prophets in the Old Testament the future history about the crucifixion of Christ. So in addition to the physical and historical events which took place, the crucifixion of Christ involves spiritual events 
which ended in Christ's victory over sin, death, and Satan. There's no question that sinful mankind hates God. Sinful mankind hated Jesus. Jesus himself said that if you are of me, if you are uh, mine, then the world will hate you because you're not of this world. You're of Christ, of God. And we know that besides human hatred for God because of sin, we also have demonic hatred satanic hatred for god satan rebelled against god and there's a spiritual hatred that's going on here so we have human hatred satanic hatred and we've got all this combining and coming together at the cross before identifying and discussing the old testament prophecies which john described as being fulfilled in the crucifixion of christ let's hear what john wrote in his gospel Starting with verse 16, John writes, Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Notice how little information John gives about the suffering of Jesus. Notice how brief John's account of the crucifixion is. Why does he leave so many things out? Is it because the other gospels put these things in and people are aware of that? Or was it John making the point that we're going to discuss in tonight's lesson is that John put certain things in his account of the crucifixion to demonstrate that the crucifixion of Jesus fulfilled what God had revealed beforehand about the crucifixion. The gospel of John personally purposely references to the Old Testament and other prophecies which were fulfilled when Jesus was crucified. John's account of the crucifixion begins with Jesus being immediately handed over to the Roman soldiers to be executed. Um, both Jewish law and Roman law said that when a prisoner is judged guilty and sentenced to death, there has to be two full days before that death penalty is executed. What happened here? Pilate handed Jesus over to the soldiers to be executed. There were no lapse of two days in there. And so what we have is Isaiah 53, 8 saying, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. There is no delay in the execution. This is a completely unjust uh, execution of Jesus. It didn't follow Jewish law. It didn't follow Roman law. 
but it did fulfill what I, uh, uh, Isaiah was talking about is by oppression, not following the rules and judgment, he was taken away. There's no time period in between. Then John wrote that Jesus went out. The other gospels state that Jesus was let out. Isaiah prophesied in 53, 7, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Jesus knew that his purpose was to be crucified, to bear the punishment and the penalty for the sin of mankind. And so he was led, which indicates that he followed the soldiers that were leading him to the cross, he carrying his own cross. Now, he was led out of the city to Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. Northeast of the Damascus Gate, and if you look at Jerusalem, the northeast corner, um, there is a rock formation which is shaped like a skull. Golgotha is translated as skull. In Latin, the word for skull is calvarius, from which we get the English word calvary. In the Old Testament, all sin offerings, if you remember our study of Exodus, all sin offerings were taken outside the camp. They would take the bull, they would take the blood, and then they take the bull outside the camp and burn the entire bull. Sin offerings were taken outside the camp. Now, Roman law precluded any crucifixions taking place in the city. God knew that Roman law would provide that all executions and crucifixions would be outside the city. Jesus was taken outside the city. Um, Jesus carried his own cross. In the book of Genesis, when Abraham and Isaac traveled to Mount Moriah, where God entered Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac carried the wood, which would be used to make the platform that he would lie on when Abraham would take his life. Isaac is a prototype of Jesus in this regard, that he carried the wood for his sacrifice. And Jesus carried the cross to the uh, place of his sacrifice. Also not mentioned in my outline is, is that instead of sacrificing Isaac, God provided a ram for Abraham to sacrifice. Jesus is the substitute sacrifice for us. So we have references in what John wrote to what the Jewish people knew about the Old Testament, about Isaac carrying the wood to his place of sacrifice. Pilate prophetically wrote in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Pilate's words were prophetic. Pilate was angry at the Jews. He was sarcastic. So he wrote that Jesus was the king of the Jews. The Jewish leaders objected. They got the point. But Pilate says, what I've written is written. He wasn't going to change his mind. Pilate was acting in, as a human being, angry at the Jews for putting him in the position that forced him to cause Jesus to be crucified. So he said, he, he's the king of the Jews. How prophetic, because Jesus is the king. Now, Jesus' cross was between the crosses of the two criminals, fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 53, 12, that Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. Then Jesus was lifted up. In John 8, 28, Jesus referred to the scriptures in chapter 21 of the book of Numbers, where Moses lifted up a snake wrapped around a pole, instructing those bitten by snakes in the wilderness to look up to the snake on the pole to be spared from death. Jesus himself referred to this event that happened in the wilderness, and he referred to him being lifted up. And so, and those that would turn to him would receive salvation. Jesus was being prophetic. He referred back to what Moses had done in the Old Testament, all in prophecy that Jesus would be lifted up or crucified. Next, John described the Roman soldiers dividing Jesus' outer garments, his sandals, his belt, his headcloth, and his outer garment, and then casting lots to determine which Roman soldier would get his tunic. John cited the prophecy in Psalm 22:18, 18, specifically stating 
that what the Roman soldiers did fulfilled that prophecy. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Psalms 23, 18. But there's a word in here that is kind of strange. John says that this inner garment they cast lots for was seamless. Why put that in there? Seems like a trivial thing. Well, maybe he put it in there because it couldn't be torn apart and divided among the soldiers. But many scholars believe that he pointed out that Jesus' tunic was seamless because who wore a seamless garment in the Old Testament? The high priest. And so John is pointing out here that Jesus is the high priest by just a simple word pointing out that the tunic that they cast lots for was seamless. Now we get to the main part where most of us recognize Jesus suffering on the cross is described in Psalm 22. Starting with verse 14, the prophet writes, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like I'm not sure what that is. Okay. And it's totally so that you, oh boy, as a potsherd. I'm sorry, I've got some other words in here. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. People stare and gloat over me. You can't read Psalms 22 without thinking of the details of the crucifixion. Um, the dehydration, your bones are out of joint because you're hanging on a cross and your weight is dragging you down, but you're for, you can't go all the way down. You're struggling to breathe by lifting yourself up. The, basically full exhaustion, dehydration, all of these things in Psalm 22 describe Jesus on the cross. Now, I think there are probably some other points we can spend some time where John's account of Jesus's crucifixion point to the fulfillment of prophecy. But I think those are ample evidence of what John was trying to do in his gospel. He was, he was pointing out, not emphasizing the physical suffering, but pointing out by the words he used, references to the Old Testament, which would identify Jesus as the Messiah. And so when we look at what John is doing, is he's saying, God gave you prophecy about how he would redeem those that believe in him, how he would redeem Israel. He would do that through the Messiah. In Isaiah, he said, Messiah is a suffering servant. So J John is basically trying to prove that Jesus is the Messiah that God talked about in the Old Testament by showing how what God revealed to the prophets actually happened when Jesus was crucified. Amen. So with that, we're going to get into the discussion questions that uh, are going to expand our understanding. <laughs> by way of implications, conclusions, and applications, in the Old Testament, God revealed his plan to redeem mankind through the suffering, sacrifice, and death of the Messiah, who is revealed as God's suffering servant. The Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah were revealed to the prophets in order to identify the Messiah when the Messiah was sent into the world to accomplish God's redemptive plan. The specific events about the Messiah not only identified who the Messiah was, but also revealed what the Messiah was sent to accomplish. The Old Testament prophecies were future historical events revealed to the prophets long before the events ever took place. When John wrote his gospel, he stated that what he wrote was intended to prove that Jesus is the Son of God sent into the world to give eternal life to those who believe. To prove that Jesus was the Messiah who God sent as a Lamb of God who took upon himself the wrath, judgment, and punishment of God as a substitutionary sacrifice to atone for the sins of mankind, John relied upon the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and demonstrated that the prophecies were fulfilled by the historical events which took place when Jesus was crucified. 
the fulfillment of the prophecies about the Messiah proved that Jesus is the Messiah, which God promised. Amen. Very good. All right. 